Hello and welcome to our OSDFCon webinar series. Today we have Dr. Ali Hadi and Dr. Maryam Khader. Uh, I hope I pronounced that sort of right. Um, and they are here talking about Linux and GUI environments. So we hope you will learn something today. Before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Ali Devine. I'm the event manager at Basis Technology, and I'm really just here to make sure everything runs smoothly. So if you have questions anytime during the presentation, please feel free to ask them throughout, but they will most likely be answered during the Q&A session. To submit a question, just type it into the questions pane of the control panel. This webinar is being recorded, so we're going to email out the link to everyone who registered. So definitely look out for that. And if you miss anything or you know someone else interested in watching it, you can definitely share it with them. We scheduled the webinar for 45 minutes. So after a very brief introduction from me, there's going to be a 30 minute presentation followed by a Q&A session. And I always talk about this, but at the very end, there will be a survey. We would really love it if you let us know your opinion of today's webinar. As mentioned, I work for Basis Technology. We've been around for 25 years and our cyber forensics team focuses on building easy to use software for the people who are on the front lines of cyber investigations. So we build Autopsy, which is one of our, the most popular open source digital forensics tools in existence. And we also make a tool for incident response called Cyber Triage, which is focused on intrusion related investigations and it really just automates as much of the process as possible. As the event manager for BASIS, I did want to do a quick plug for an event that we're planning for September 13th in Herndon, Virginia. As many of you might have seen recently, we are pausing OSDFCon this year and we're holding an event a little bit more focused on ransomware called Cyber Responder Con. So we sent out an email about it the other day. In case you missed it, you can definitely check back. I imagine most of you here are on our email list. And the call for presentations is open through June 10th. So if you have something that you want to talk about or submit or want to sign up for updates, go to cyberrespondercon.com and all the info for that is there. So that's mostly it for me. Let's get started. Um, I want to introduce you to Dr. Ali Hadi, professor and um, program director, I think, at Champlain College, and also co-founder and CTO at Cyber5W, which is a digital forensics training and consulting company. Um, and a fun fact about Ali is he is a computer addict who just can't leave his desk. So I think we need to prescribe him some outside time so he gets outside since it's spring now. Um, and we are also joined by Dr. Maryam Khader, an assistant professor at Champlain College. And a fun fact about Maryam is she loves horses very much and they're, because they're strong and loyal and they stand for pre freedom and pride, which is beautiful because horses are amazing. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you guys for being here and I'm going to leave it with you. Thank you, Ali, for the introduction, and uh, th w welcome, everyone. I hope my you can hear me very well, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Can you go back, Mariam? Yeah. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar where we will be talking about uh, Linux investigations. Uh, now, over the past couple of years, we've done a lot of talks about uh, Linux investigations. We've put a lot of workshops as well so this is just a continue of where we've left probably uh, last year and the year before and the year before and just go back <laughs> uh, there's a lot of content we will uh, have them on the slides at the end that you can also uh, go back and uh, look at now today's or this i would say this year's uh, work what we focus more on was on the on the gui side so one of the things that uh, you might arrive to a case where Linux is being used and you might find it confusing that, uh, let's say, compared to Windows, when you arrive there, once you arrive, you know what you are expecting to see on a system. But on a Linux system, when you arrive to a, a scene where you're going to be dealing with a, a Linux system, the GUI is going to be different it, because it depends on the preference of the user. So we might have multiple faces, but at the end, it's only one single system. Next, please. Uh, who am I? I think Ali introduced us very, very well, but uh, our, I would say, our Twitter handles are at the end. Uh, if you are 
interested in contacting us and reaching out for if you have any questions even beyond the uh, the webinar next okay so this is what we are going to be covering today a little bit about linux display common forensic artifacts and then we are really going to cover more than one single not even not just two desktops it's more than uh, one desktop so which which are kde meet and gnome now uh, what we did is we created the content around two case studies uh, one of the case studies about policy violation and and all of this by the way data set is available if anyone wants to like download and play with we, we have a url at the end where you can also go there and get access to them one of them was about policy violation and uh, a user violated some uh, company's policy and uh, we we tested that on on multiple systems so that way we can see how it will work on how what what evidence we will find when we are dealing with a gnome or what evidence with a mate and a kde system etc and another case which is co uh, copyright infringement can we go next so Linux displays, one of the important things about Linux displays uh, is to understand first its architecture. It's really not like, a, it's not just a system uh, which is kind of uh, comes directly with the kernel or with the operating system itself. It's a component or it's another system which you can add and remove. So that's why you might find uh, a system with no GUI because that component or that system is not there but if we do have it then one of the examples is the x server even though it's one of the oldest systems around used not just by the way on linux it's also used on unix and x server these will deals with everything running on top of it as if it's a as if it's a client so that, that's why we have an x client and then an x server and that's also one of the reasons why uh, because it uses the uh, TCP IP protocol or it uses networking, we can also use it to communicate over the network. So I can run, uh, for example, uh, a GUI application on a system while I'm running it from a, a, remote, a remote computer. So I'm running a, a GUI on my computer, but I'm running it from another computer on an, another system. That's one. Also, the display manager. These are components of the graphical interface. So they are not, like I said, it's not just one single system. They are multiple components together. They bring us this fancy desktop, which we are using. So there's a display manager and different users or users will have their own preference as well to use a different display manager and display manager is responsible of how the things or how the windows are going to be uh, like displayed or what how, how they come up and show up also we have the windows manager which is more related to how the window exactly itself is displayed and the environment or the desktop environment like uh, mate kde and all of those uh, and then we have the applications themselves all of these will communicate through the X server and then the X server is going to be communicating with the Linux kernel, which at the end deals with the hardware. Now, when we are talking about uh, graphical environments and talking about investigating, let's say, users, then definitely one of the important things are is to also uh, check logins and log out. When did the user log in? When did the user log out of their system? That's also something of interest to us. On Linux systems, on most of them, I would say, then we have three files which we need to pay attention to. One is, and they are in these directories, or or the the main two files actually are the the ones are which in under the var log directory, but the one which is under the var run, this is when the system is currently running and we have a user currently logged in. So we can see UTMP. That's when we have a user currently logged on, and you can see the. Uh, the uh, content uh, or let's say the figure below which is running that's running out of another file which is a btmp where we want to check when did the user have failed login attempts and that's a good place to check for example if you want to see if there was any kind of brute force happening on the system if you want to also check a history of logins for the user then we will definitely check the uh, the file which is called wtmp which is also under the var log uh, messages now I know these are not directly related to the graphical environment, but at the end, these are also very important things that we usually will start our uh, investigation with. 
the tool that we can, we are using here, as you can see here, we can use it even for offline checking, which is the UTMP dump, and we can use that to dump the contents of these files, because by the way, these files are not normal text files, they are uh, binary files. So we need a tool to uh, be able to parse them. Now, seats, think of a seat as it's a kind of a, uh, creating an organizer for a workspace. When you, when a user logs in, a seat is created for that user, which uh, has uh, connections or has an attachment to all the hardware which are available. And that way the user can now start dealing with that hardware available. But one of the important things for us is whenever the user, the user sorry, logs in, there will be uh, an event created or there will be a log created which says new seat, seat zero has been created. Now this indicates that the user has successfully logged into the system and then I can use that to understand with, with whatever we also saw in the previous slide that this is when the user actually logged in and now their graphical environment has uh, been displayed. I can also use the seats to understand when the user logs out, because at the end they might just log out of their session or the GUI, we can use that. And we can also use it when we want to find out when a reboot or a shutdown has happened as well. Next, please. If we look at these, uh, here we are parsing the logs. Uh, all of them, we are parsing the var log journal CTL, uh, journal logs, excuse me. So if we go to that directory, if we go to that directory, we will be able to see uh, all of the logs about uh, seats. And I use the filter, and the filter is available, by the way, also uh, on the screen. You can see it when we specify that we are interested in looking at a seat. So we are filtering all of the seats just to the seat ID, and we give it the seat ID. And below, and in the other figure below, we can also search for a specific user. So you can specify that this is the user I want to search for. And that way we can use journal CTL, which is, the, which is a command available. You can use that to search through the journal, which is, by the way, the journal is kind of uh, all the logs on the Linux system. And we can use this command line to, to pass through it. Next. Okay, so I think you all agree with me that one of the best thing about Linux, the different distribution that you can select it from. More, more about this, that there are different desktop environments which you can also select. So for each distribution in Linux, there will be a, def a, de a default desktop environment. Besides that, you can change the default desktop environment and choose one that you like, or you can even choose to download two or more desktop environment in Linux. Okay, so this is the focus of our investigation here. We focused on the most used desktop environment for Linux distributions, which are the KDE Plasma, GNOME, and Make. However, in this part, I'll be talking about common artifact. So the artifact that I'll be talking about will be the same or common between the three of these desktop environments. So this is our checklist. This is not a comprehensive checklist, but because of the time limitation, we'll talk about these artifacts. For each artifact, I'll be talking about the, the meaning of each artifact and the relevance for your investigation. The first one and the simple one is the hidden files. In Linux, if you want to hide a file or a, or a directory, you can just rename the file and put a dot inside its name as you can see this file any directory or file with dot in the beginning of its name means this file or directory is hidden and you can see it if you use the usual listing of comments okay so this is what, i know this is a simple one but you need to start with this one to see and to check if there is any hidden files or directories the second one is the bash history file this is also a hidden file, but this is a system file. It contains all the comment that you, the user has executed in the system. So using this one and checking for the history of the comment, you can check and see what an attacker has attempted, uh, has executed in the system, for example, and what has been happened in the system. 
The second one talks about the XBG directories. This is just a, a standard to specify where the files and data of applications will be stored. So instead of uh, storing everything about an application like data, data, cache, and configuration in the same place. Now the data will be stored in three folders, as you can see on the left. We have the dot cache folder, dot local share, and dot config. The dot cache folder will contain the cache data, which is non essential user information, and the local share will contain the user essential information in this application, and the dot config will contain the configuration data. The purpose of creating this specification or this directory is to give the user better experience. So, for example, you can clear the cache by just removing the data in the dot cache folder, or you can create a backup of the data by just creating or copy the data in the local share without considering anything in the dot cache folder, or you can even set the application for its default configuration using the data in the dot config folder. Okay, so it is good to understand this file to understand directories to understand where the data is actually stored. This is for the XBG directories. However, if the application does not adhere to the XBG directories, you can see at the right how the data is will, will be stored. So in the user home directory, the data will be stored there, or it will be stored in a folder with dot in front of its name. And as you can see in the in the Bottom of the slide, you can see in Windows, for example, the application data is stored in the C user, username, app data, local, and company name, application name. In Linux, if it was based on the XBG data or directories, it will be stored in the dot local share and app name. And as you can see here, we are in this file, you can see the standard directories that for a specific user. Okay, the next one is the thumbnail. This is one of the great artifacts that you can use. For example, uh, the thumbnail are used to whenever a user open a folder, and this folder contains, for example, images, videos, or video files. A small image, a thumbnail, will be created for each file. So this Artifact to prove that the user has opened this directory and viewed the file within the directory. So you can prove that the user has entered this directory. And even if the user does not click and open the file, a thumbnail will be created for this user. Okay. So why are the thumbnail important? Because the thumbnail appears in the Tell the dot cache thumbnail, so they are created for each user. So you can relate them with the user, and they are created in three different folders: normal, large, and field. So based on the image size, they are will be stored in the normal or or large. And if the system cannot even create a thumbnail for a specific file, it will store information about this file in this directory. All the thumbnail will be in the BNG format and they will contain the URI and the modification time of the file. So we can find the file, the path where the file is stored and information about the file itself. Now, one of the best thing about thumbnail also is that even if the user has deleted the file, you can, you still can find the thumbnail of this file. And here you can see, this is just to show how, what is the content of the thumbnail. So, if you if you can see the image now now the thumbnail will be stored as md hash of the uri of the file itself so these are thumbnail of the files in a specific directory and if you use exit tool to see the content of the thumbnail itself you can see it contains the file name it will contain the size of the file it will contain the access the creation time and modification time of the file and the size of the original file. The next artifact that we will talk about is the recently used artifact. Now this file, which is called recently used file, 
will contain the files that has been opened by the user. Okay, and this is an XML file and contain uh, data in text format so you can easily see the file and see its content. It will contain the name of the file that the user has opened, the type of the file, when the file was opened, and it will contain also information about which application opened this file and how many times this, this file was opened by the user. So you can use the information in this file to prove what files the user has opened and used in the system. And this is an example of it. This is also stored in the user home directory, the local share. The file is written to use this Excel, and you can see here, this is the file name, and you can see the other information about the file. Next is the trash folder. This is the same as the recycle bin in Windows. So if the user or the suspect try to delete any file, this file will be moved to the trash, as you can see. Now, in the trash, there will be two folders. One of them is files and one of them is info. The files will contain the actual file that was deleted and the info will contain metadata about the files that has been deleted. Okay. Um, now, as we said, like for each user, there will be a dot local share folder. Inside this folder, there will be two fo other folders. One of them is files and one of them is info. And in this slide, you can see if you go to the trash folder, you can see the files and the info. And each one of them, for each deleted file, there will be two files. One of them is the actual data of the deleted file, and the second will contain the metadata information, such as when the file was deleted, the path of the file before it was deleted, and the deletion date. Okay. Besides this artifact, which is going between different files and applications, for specific applications, you need to study this application. So, for example, for the DLC, if we want to see this, this application, so you need to study its directories and understand how it stores its information because some applications will have their own history files. So, for example, in this one, you can see at the end, you can see the files that has been opened by the user and added to a list. So here is the list of all the files that has been opened by this application. And even you can sometimes, when the user created an album for this, when the user created an album for these files, the icon that was created for this file will also contain information that can be used for the investigation. So you can go to this image and read it data, which will tell you more information about what has been doing, happened in the system. Okay, okay so uh, we'll talk now, focus on one of the main uh, systems. So we covered the, the general artifacts. Now we are gonna focus on artifacts on a specific system or a specific desktop environment, which is KDE. KDE uses the what is called the Plasma desktop. Next. So one of the first things in KDE, which is a really, I, I think it's a really cool uh, thing to check, is there is a service called uh, Balu. Uh, Balu is a service which is indexing uh, all of the files on a system. There are exceptions, by the way, for what is not being indexed, like for example, any any file which is beyond any text file, sorry, which is beyond like 10 megabytes uh, is not being indexed. Uh, there are other exceptions, but everything I would say that has uh, a standard like a file format and the standard, uh, yeah, standard file format, they will all be indexed in, in, this, uh, in this file, which is the uh, index file. Now this, is, this has a binary format, so until now I, I would say we didn't do, we didn't spend uh, any time on trying to like reverse engineer or find out how this structure is. So currently, as you can see here in the figures, what we are running is just like uh, going through it as strings and trying to dump the strings which we can find that have been indexed within this uh, within this database. 
but there, there is a format definitely for that. Probably someone someday might find uh, a tool or create a tool for it. But it's a great way to start because, uh, again, whatever uh, this is indexing files on the user system. So if we want to check what files were there on the system and they probably have been deleted, then I can go to this uh, database and then search through it and see what has been indexed there. Now, Dolphin directory preferences, you can think of this similar if you do uh, Windows investigations. This is similar to kind of, I would say, to some extent, similar to shell bags on a Windows system where the user, when they navigate to a directory and all of the, the preferences within the directory and how things are displayed within the directory are stored within shell bags. This is kind of similar to that. They are stored within uh, this path that you can see here below, Dolphin, and then View Properties, Global, and then the .directory file. It's just a text file, by the way, that you can display and uh, read its contents. Now, the timestamp always also will tell you when the last modification has happened. Not, I would say, depending on how many sections are there. In, in, in the example you see below, it probably just has one section, but depending on how many changes and modifications you do, they will, it will have probably more sections, and each section will have a timestamp saying, when was this activity uh, modified? And, and by the way, just if I, uh, one thing probably I, I forgot to mention, that all, all also helps us understand if the user has been to this directory or not. So it's also another uh, great location to check. Next, uh, Marian. Now, uh, installation of packages, I know this is not directly, by the way, also uh, related to KDE. It's probably for any system which is using uh, a Debian-based package manager. So if we, if we want to check, for example, uh, we want to check an application that has been installed and how was that application installed, then we can go, there are two locations. One of them is uh, checking the uh, dpackage.log file. And if we find the application in there, then it means the application was installed using the, D, uh, the DPKG uh, package manager, okay? Now, if we want to also check who did the installation or who had the authorization to do the installation, then we'll need to check the auth.log file. And all the log files, by the way, by default, they are under, var log, uh, under the var log directory. The other location to check is if we have them, especially again on like Ubuntu systems, if we have them installed by APT. So we can check the APT directory. And as you can see here, uh, APT really gives us more, I would say, uh, more information about the application, how, is it, how it was installed. So we can see here, APT install minus Y Google Chrome. So in our case, we wanted to check how was Google Chrome installed on the system. So it shows us like here, and you can see uh, it has the start date, it has the command line, it has even who was the user who did the request to, to uh, do the installation, and it also has when did the installation end, so it will have when did it start and when did it end. Now, K-Activities, this is a service, or this is the daemon working in the background. It's a service continuously running, and this probably is one of the greatest artifacts on a KDE system for a reason. This is storing and just continuously running in the background, and it's storing every uh, user activity that's happening, <coughs> excuse me, happening on the system or at the GI level. So when a user, for example, opens a file with some editor, that file and that editor are going to be documented or listed within this database. It's a SQLite database, so you can, like we can see here, we use a, a SQLite browser to just parse the database. Okay, and it's continuously running. Whenever a user, for example, navigates to a directory, it's also listing, <coughs> excuse me, it's also listing the, the directory, the, the explorer, which was used to navigate to the directory and the location. If a user, for example, opens a multimedia file, like a, a video, and that video with the, multi, the video, the file itself, its name, the location, and uh, which application was used is also going to be listed here. So it's really a great place to start your investigation if you want, if you have a, like a, a KDE system, and it's all backed up, not just with, if we go next, uh, Maria, 
<coughs> excuse me. Uh, it's not also just listing uh, which application was used, okay, and what file was used with it. It's also listing the dates when that application was used. So if I have uh, used, let's say, on my system, just an example, if I have used uh, Firefox multiple times, then there will be multiple entries, but each one of them with a specific timestamp. And all of that is, as you can see here in the path below, uh, local share key activity managed. Uh, Manager D, resource database. This is a SQLite database. You can just load it in any SQLite uh, tool and, and pass it from there. Now, recent documents as well. If we want to navigate, similar to recent documents, by the way, also on Windows. So, if people like to compare between a Windows operating system, uh, this is the same thing. So, when a user uh, recently has been, let's say, opening some documents, opening some files, those are going to be stored within this directory. So if you just go there, you can find the file. These are all, by the way, text files, which you can just uh, dump the content of them and list them, like you can see here. Uh, and you can list what are the files that have been uh, recently used by, by this user. So whenever a user opens a file, it's going to create a file within that directory. Next. Uh, config sessions. So. Also, KDE creates different sessions which stores, uh, excuse me, excuse me, stores information about each session. So when the user uh, is uh, like working on their system using different applications, you can see here, for example, if they were using uh, system settings, if they were uh, had some console settings, all of those settings and all of those preferences are going to be stored in .config uh, sessions directory and you can find a file for every different application that has a specific setting. So we can see when these happened or when these files were created and it gives us an idea of when probably the user created some configuration on their system. Now bookmarks, these are similar to quick access on a Windows system which you see on the side on like your left hand side when you open uh, File Explorer. Uh, and these are locations probably the user has been interested or continuously uh, navigates to. So usually they will create a bookmark. So if I want to see what are the bookmarks which are available, uh, you can see this is a, a normal XML file. All you need to do is go to that file and you can uh, browse the contents of that file, which is user places that uh, user places. Uh, session errors. Now, one of the things about sessions, uh, and this is, by the way, is also probably not just uh, KDE for related on, only, uh, is when the user logs in our X window system, whatever error is going to be thrown by the X window system, just because at the end we have, we said we have a server communicating with some clients, so the communication could lead to some errors. Those errors are going to be stored in a dot uh, X. Uh, in the dot sessions errors or in the dot x uh, errors file dot x sessions dash errors file okay uh, all of the details about the session itself about the errors that the applications was doing are going to be listed in here now you might say why would i be looking at errors it's give it can give you really an idea about what were the applications that were running on the system because most probably if an application did any kind of error that error will be listed here we don't really probably uh, the error is not of something of interest to you but what probably is is the application itself has it been used or not so you can look at this lots of the details about the display about the session about the files and all of the uh, let's say uh, the environment variables that are being loaded into this session are also going to be uh, seen in here. Also, when did this session start? Because when we logged in, if we want another location to look for when did the session start, we can also look and check this file over here. Uh, and this is also another artifact which is actually directly related to Kate, uh, directly related to KD. Kate is the main. Uh, uh, text editor on a KDE system. And if, for example, when a user was navigating some errors or, uh, sorry, navigating some text files and opening some text files, 
and was working on some text files and then for example if they close their computer reboot their computer once the system comes back up it will load these files for them so it's all of these by the way the things that we have been explaining so far most of them have been done this way for uh, making user experience much better so they are they haven't been created by their developers really for us as investigators but we are using them uh, in our investigations so if you go to this file location if you go to this location and check the anonymous.kate session you will find all of the details about the session and all of the files that the user has been loaded uh, has had uh, opened within uh, within their last session Another uh, location, which is the uh, .config uh, Kate meta infos, it also gives more, us more information about the files and more metadata about the files that we were loaded. Now, these uh, files, by the way, will help us not just know that a file was opened, like a text file was opened. You probably say, but what do I? I don't probably. I'm not interested in the text files which were open. It's useful for us probably to lo locate paths on, on the user system. Like in from uh, this directory, the user had uh, this file uh, open, so we can go to that path and look at what is in there. Or probably the file does not exist anymore, so it's also something that we can see that this file at some point in time in the past did exist on the system. Okay more artifact but these are specific to the made disturbed environment okay so the kaja directory the kaja is the default file manager in mate the user preferences are stored here so when the user try to change the for example the view of the folders here all this information if the user try to change the view of the folders this will change the File which is stored in .config kaja, uh, kaja desktop metadata. Now, this is similar to the shell bag in Windows, and I know this will not prove that a file was opened or application was run, but this will store the time when the user changed the view of the file, for example. So this time we can use it to create a timeline and help us to understand the time of the user activity in the system. Okay, and this file, for example, will contain the, the editor, the default editor for also the mate system. And here you can see that the bookmarks or specific folder for the user stored in this file. And in the same session, in this directory here, the this directory can be used to track the user activity by listing the programs that were open in the last session and that this program will be loaded when the user log into the system again so by reading the content of this folder we can know what programs the user was open in the last session so you can see here what program should be loaded at the startup of the user session which will be at the end of the file as you can see here okay and artil is the default pdf viewer in it also by reading the content of this file you can know which pdf file that was opened in the last session and this file will be opened when the user login again in the system. It was created for better user experience, so the file which was closed, it will be open again, but for us, it can prove which file was opened in the system, and we can know the path for each of these files. Also for the Bluma Save sessions, this one will also save the file that has been opened by the user, as you see at the end of the image you can see which text file was opened by the user before the system was powered off or before the user has logged out from the system. Noom 3 artifacts. Uh, can we start? So we just listed them over here to uh, just because of uh, time limitations. But these are the locations, by the way, and most of them, I would say, uh, 
Yeah, most of them, what you see here, are all just like text files, which you can open with a, a text editor. So gedit is the main uh, a text editor on uh, GNOME 3. Uh, and you can just uh, like look at the, uh, it, it is used for the uh, opening like text files. So similar to the sessions, which we saw previously on Kate, and uh, other documents, uh, we can use that to trace back what type of uh, files were opened. Sorry, not what type of files. What were the files that we have been opened? Now, the tracker here is similar to Balo, kind of. Also, it's tracking all of the uh, keywords and files on, on the GNOME system. Uh, Deconfuser, we can see all of the dash settings, pin settings, all of the, uh, on GNOME, you'll have like a, a dash on the left-hand side or depending on how you, uh, you uh, let's say, uh, how you prefer it. Some people might move it to some other location. But all of the configurations on that and on the desktop environment and how you deal with that is all going to be stored under uh, .config uh, deconf directory. Uh, we also have similar to previous uh, two uh, environments which we talked about, which is the GNOME-session. So uh, similar to that, also anything related to the saved session and anything that you want to be loaded when you just log into the, the environment, they will be stored in there. So if you wanted to know what was uh, what was running at the time, maybe when the system was powered off or before the system was powered off, etc., you can go to that directory and, and look at them. Uh, bookmarks, similar to the places or quick places, quick access, sorry, we can find them under .config gtk-3.0 and then bookmarks. Uh, local share GNOME shell, so anything related to the GNOME shell itself, like you are adding some new uh, add-ons, uh, like new desktop uh, features on, on there, you can also find those in, on, under the GNOME shell directory. Now the dot desktop files, these are shortcuts to applications. So usually when the user installs an application or if they want to like have a shortcut to an application, they will have a file which is a dot desktop file. So from there I can know where this application is probably uh, installed or where is it pointing to. So it's also a good place to check for uh, applications. Which is a dot vm uh, info and this will give you and this is also by the way not just for uh, noom 3 related you can find it on other systems kde uh, mate etc you can find all of the like the command line history all of the search history about uh, which were used within uh, a vim session so when a user uses vim i know probably lots of people today are moving away from vim just because they think it's uh, complicated uh, because everything in there is a command, so they will move to Nano and others. But if, for example, Vim is used, then this is where you'll find uh, details about all of the Vim uh, activity. Uh, I think this is just a duplicate. Uh, we would just like to especially thank uh, Alina Cash. Uh, Alina is a second year student at Champlain College. And she helped us, me and her and uh, Mariam, worked on creating the data. So the data which was used for this presentation uh, was all created by all three of us. Also, thanks to Cyber5 for their support, Champlain College, and also thanks to the uh, Linux Suzuki guys, because uh, all of the investigations that, by the way, and the screenshots that you saw were created by, uh, were created, sorry, on a Tsurugi uh, Linux environment. Would you like to talk about that, Mariam? <laughs> or should I talk? It's okay. So we created a mini CTF challenge, and this is the link for the challenge. If you go and solve the question there, you will get a 30% discount on C5W courses, which is provided by Professor Ali. Um, the challenge and the question is all about the three desktop environment that we have worked on. So the VM that we investigated, they will be uploaded and you can download them. You can use them for your own investigation or you can solve the question and get the 30 percent discount. And these are the references. And if you want to read more about, about them, this is most of the research about that has been done in Linux forensics. And if you want to read more, you can go here.
And I think this is the end. And if you have time for questions. Uh, by the way, these are all the talks that we've done in the past. You can see uh, they, they focused on different things. And uh, below the last, uh, the last URL here below Linux DFIR, uh, that's where you can find everything uh, about uh, previous uh, talks and workshops, uh, all related to uh, Linux, uh, investiga Linux investigations. Yeah. I can go uh, to the questions now if we have uh, Lauren. Hello. hello back, Lauren. Uh, Joseph uh, asking, can I find, can I have the slides after the webinar? Yes, you can. I think they are already shared here, by the way. You can just download them in the handouts. Hand out, yep. Yeah. Uh, also, will I get a certificate of attendance? I think uh, Ali can answer that question. Uh, can you improve uh, Khadr's sound? We'll work on that, <laughs> David. Uh, I have just downloaded. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Can I get certificate? Yep. Uh, very much. I appreciate that. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Are these slides available anywhere? I cannot keep up with her to be able to take notes. Yeah, don't worry about that. They are all available. Uh, they will all be available on our uh, on our repository. You can find all of them. And also, like we said, the, all, the data set as well, if you want to play with the data that we did, they are all gonna be available to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Please disregard, just so the download, no worries. Can a user with sudo or root permission stop key activities to cover their, yeah, actually it's a service, so that's yes, that will, uh, that could be done, great question. But also uh, keep in mind when when let's say I uh, disable, uh, let's say I'm the threat actor and I disable the service, it's gonna be listed in the authorization file that I disabled. Uh, there will be like an entry saying I disabled the service. So I need to do cover my tracks, delete both of them, not not just disable the service as well. Uh, thank you all so much. You're very welcome, Sean. Uh, Alicia, will you get certificates? Yes, Alicia, I think you will. Uh, Akila. Uh, very informed, valuable session. Thank you very much. If you can send the session recording link for future reference. I think, uh, uh, Akila, that also uh, will be available through uh, Basis Technology. Uh, I think they will be providing that as well. I'm definitely sure they will. Uh, they are recording. Excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you too for attending. Uh, Pablo, prefer mount file system or autopsy on forensic image? We honestly, we usually, it's not a, a, a preference. Uh, all of autopsy is great, actually. We use it even at the college. It's just we wanted to show a way that even without, let's say, a forensic toolkit or a forensic suite, uh, you can, with simple commands, simple tools, you can do investigation. So it's not really, we are not against autopsy or any other uh, forensic uh, suite. It's just that we, using probably you'll see all of our cases we only use linux to investigate linux probably like once or twice we used eric zimmerman's like timeline explorer for listing uh, csv files great question pablo thank you uh, sean we all were so great thank you. you're welcome sean thank you too uh, will you be posting the link to the video? I'd like to watch this again. I appreciate that. I'm definitely sure it's going to be recorded, uh, Don. Uh, will there be a download of this recording? I, I, I assume there will, or at least you'll be able to watch it again whenever you want, especially that you've already mm -hmm. uh, registered. Uh, did you compare your findings with the commercial tools? To be honest with you, we did not do that. Probably it's a good this is a good idea that we do that with, for example, compare with autopsy, what they, what autopsy can find, excuse me, also with maybe, uh, let's say, X, uh, Axiom, also what Axiom can find, because now Axiom can do Linux investigations. Excuse me. So it's probably going to be a good thing to check moving on, but no, we did not do that currently. Thank you, Blon, for the question. I saw a question about sending the challenge link, so I put it again in the slides. You can see it now. Okay, great. Okay, uh, great class and very informative. Thank you. Uh, thank you too, Scott, for attending. Which environment do you prefer the most for forensics? Uh, 
we usually use uh, Tsurugi, but nothing against others. There are lots of great uh, systems out there. Uh, Tsurugi, Gio is my friend, and I want to like support you. And he, him and his team doing a great work with uh, Tsurugi Linux. So that's the reason probably I'm kind of probably a little bit biased to that, but it's really just a matter of preference at the end. Thank you for the question, Ahmed. Uh, great work, I did it for you. Um, do you need to be logged in to do all these comments? Uh, the question from Adriana. Question from where? Adriana. Uh, Adriana, I still probably haven't reached that yet. I'm going yeah, yeah, to. Okay. Yeah. Huh? I'm yeah, yeah, from you haven't from reached that. Uh, so we will check your CTF. Thanks. Uh, thank you to uh, Ni Nio, if, I, if that's okay, I pronounce your name that way. I apologize, I cannot pronounce your name. Uh, thank you, Ali and Mariam. Thank you too, Jay, for attending. Appreciate this. Uh, thank you very much. We'll be trying it soon. Thank you to Adriana. Robert, excellent webinar. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for coming here. Uh, Akila, is it possible to send the challenge link again? Uh, I think you already did that, great. Well done on presentation, valuable material and items to examine. Thank you too, uh, Thomas. I hope the material will be available so you can also play with this. Uh, will we be able to download the recorded video? I, I, th I, I assume you can, Sean. Alicia, great, thank you for sharing your knowledge. You're welcome, Alicia. Adrian, do you need to be logged in to do these commands? No, you mean, if you mean uh, live on the live system, uh, no. Uh, actually, all of what you saw were run offline. These were all on the images, uh, the forensic images, and we just used Surugi, uh, mounted all of the images, and then went from there. So no, you don't need to do them. And actually, by the way, it's not uh, some of the some of the artifacts. It's not a good idea to do them live because, for example, like the recent documents. Whenever you're going to open a file, that's going to be recorded as an open file. So keep that in mind. Sean, awesome. Thank you. You're awesome too for attending. Are these artifacts discoverable in cloud containers, Docker? Uh, actually, one of the things we will, uh, we, we did do this uh, on uh, Docker, but we are considering now for next year to do uh, forensics on Docker containers. Uh, so it's also another idea that we could uh, probably look into. Thank you, Tanji. Uh, is there a due date to sign up for the course? No, the, if you mean about the discount, that's all until the, the end of the year. So you're, it will be there till the end of the year. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, thank you to Michelle. And are the images available so we can practice? Yes, Mark, they are available. You can download them. If you go to the link for the CTF, they are available over there. Uh, Given the numerous location of logs and potential of this, there are sufficient likelihood anti-forensics for these GUIs. We really didn't look into anti-forensics, but like you, you saw, most of them are like just normal text files, so they can probably, and even like what Maryam was uh, mentioned uh, uh, when we, she was talking, some of them, those directories, you can just delete them. So if the user just deletes them, then now it's a matter of how we can recover those data and doing file uh, carving and all of that. But we did not look into anti-forensics of these GUI, to be honest with you. Good question, Raymond. Thank you. Uh, been working with Linux over 15 years and still managed to learn a few things. Great webinar. I appreciate that, John. Uh, I myself have been working with Linux for also like you for more than 15 years. And I'm like fascinated with the information that we can find on our systems. Uh, Emily, thank you so much. This was very informative. Thank you too also for attending. Uh, Cole, uh, brilliant webinar. Thank you too uh, for attending. Uh, thanks for your work. Thank you too, Blom. Blom, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you too, Fenaida. I hope I also pronounce your way, name correctly. Uh, Isa, uh, can we have the recording? I assume uh, it is recorded. So hopefully you will, or at least you'll be able to replay it again. Uh, Ritika, uh, thank you for enlightening webinar. Thank you too for enlightening and attending uh, uh, Ritika. Uh, thank you, Ali and Mariam. Thank you too, Fadli, for attending. 
Thank you for this. I have seen very little research in this area, so extremely grateful for this. Thank you to Tyler for uh, attending, and I hope, uh, Tyler, I'm sure you've done a lot of similar work, uh, but I, uh, you can also look at our previous work. Hopefully we'll be able to put, I know this has been something we've asked a lot of times, to put like a cheat sheet for uh, people working uh, in the field doing Linux investigations, so hopefully we'll get that uh, up as soon as possible. Excellent presentation. Thank you too, Gary. Uh, appreciate that. Dear Ali and Maria, I would definitely like to apply this as at the scale helps of EDRs that are on Linux first. I will look into this. Thanks again. Thank you too, Thomas, for uh, I appreciate that note as well. Hopefully you'll be able to use it. Derek, I'm stuck on the repository question for the mini CTF. I'm not going to give you the answer, Derek. Can you briefly discuss the repository and what an extra application is? So the idea here was uh, we can, on Linux systems, add extra repositories. So those are repositories that uh, don't come when you do the installation. So we can add them and that gives us now capability to install even more software from those repositories. So we only want you to find what was the name of that repository. I'm not giving you the answer, Derek. But thanks for the, the question. Uh, thank you for the webinar. Thank you too, uh, Loan or Ion. Uh, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Uh, excellent job, both of you. Thank you, Mark. I hope you liked it. I uh, thank you for attending, even, and I know you're a busy man. Uh, half knee. Awesome presentation. Do you have any reference for MySQL database forensics? I really don't, other than probably, by the way, uh, or you mean MySQL database, sorry. I thought SQL. Uh, I don't really have on top of my head a, a, like a reference for uh, MySQL database forensics, but maybe. Good question. Uh, thanks for all the work on this. I will be adding this to my daily skill set. Thank you to uh, Michael. I hope it will be beneficial to you. Excuse me. Derek, thank you. Thank you too. I think that was the last question. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate that. Yes, thank you everybody and thank you Ali and Miriam um, and everyone you guys and Ali, it was amazing you watching you just go through all of the questions um, and comments. I actually enjoyed that. <laughs> Sorry. Wait thank that. you, Ali, for um, uh, the opportunity. Thanks. Yep. Um, and if you have any additional questions and you guys want to reach out to them, I did um, in the chat put their Twitter handles so you can find it there. And I'm also going to include it in the follow-up email to answer everybody's questions. Yes, you will be getting a follow-up of the recording. If you can download it, that is a good question. I don't know if you can download it, but at some point we'll also be putting it on YouTube. So um, there that hopefully puts everyone's minds at ease where they can always access it if needed. Um, we do currently have one more OSDFCon webinar scheduled for July 20th where Jessica Hyde is going to be talking about Chromebook forensics. So I put that link in the chat as well along with the link to Cyber Responder Con. So hopefully you can join us there. And that's it. Thanks for joining everybody and hopefully we'll see you next time. Have a great day, night, wherever you are. Bye.